Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Can I welcome you to the eighth meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015? Can I remind everybody present to ensure that all electronic devices are switched off at all times? They do, uh, or they can, certainly interfere with the sound system. Um, so I would be appreciate if they were all at least on silent, if not completely switched off. Uh, we have received apologies this morning from uh, Gordon MacDonald, who is unable to be with us, but everybody else is here. Uh, our first item is whether to consider items three and four at this meeting in private. Uh, do members agree? Agreed. Thank you very much. Our next item is our third evidence session on educational attainment. Uh, this week we will be asking how parents, including guardians and schools, can best work together to raise all pupils' attainment, particularly those whose attainment is at the lowest end of the scale. And we have received a large number of written submissions, including from today's witnesses, uh, and the committee would like to thank all of those who have contributed to our discussions. Uh, we also commissioned SPICE to undertake a small survey for us of parents and guardians to inform the meeting. And I'm delighted to say we received over 2,500 responses um, uh, to that survey. Uh, can I thank SPICE um, for doing that work for us and also for those, to those who all responded to the survey. Um, we will obviously be discussing some of the key findings uh, during our uh, meeting this morning. Can I welcome, though, to the committee um, Dr Sarah Morton from the University of Edinburgh, Ian Ellis, MBE, National Parent Forum of Scotland, Jackie Toland, Parent Network Scotland, Eileen Pryor, Scottish Parent Teacher Council, and Shona Crawford from Western Bartonshire Council. Good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, we have quite a large panel, five members is quite a large panel. Uh, I'll say the usual thing that I say, you don't all have to answer every question, but if you have something particular that is different to, to add, then please indicate, uh, and I'll try and come to you. Uh, but we're going to move straight to questions because I'm sure we've got a lot of things we want to cover this morning. Uh, and can I begin uh, this morning by asking you about uh, the survey that we undertook um, and your views on it? I just wondered what the witness panel see as the most significant um, uh, findings that came out of the survey, if you have a view on that. Eileen. I, I think what I would say is that, that it reflects that those parents who are involved feel involved and generally um, have a positive impression of, of how that engagement works for them. Um, our biggest challenge, though, is that those parents who didn't respond, and, and you know, I think your, your analysis of the, the survey is, is, is pretty good, that there's a whole lot of parents out there who are not engaged, and it's their voices we're not hearing, um, and those are the voices that, that really are, are most relevant to this, this, this whole evidence session. Jackie, did you want to add something there? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's most of the parents that we come into contact with are parents that have had a um, difficult educational experience, and they tend to be the ones that wouldn't answer um, surveys. And also, if English is a second language or there's literacy issues, it's quite hard to engage them. So I think that whilst the, the findings appear to be quite good, there definitely is a gap, especially the parents that we engage with. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to add anything? I'd just like to agree with colleagues. That's everything that they've said. OK, thank you. Sorry, Sarah. It might be worth thinking in the future about trying to boost the sample in some way to, to try and select the people who are most relevant to uh, this area or have some focus groups in um, agencies who are, who are working with those harder-to-reach parents. I have to say, I mean, I, I, there are a number of caveats with the survey, I mean, not least by which, obviously, it's a self-selecting group. Who, who answer, and I'm sure the most, the most engaged to who answer these sort of surveys. So accepting that and the fact it was rather Edinburgh-centric, um, and in fact, obviously, quite a large part of the sample was from uh, parents of those whose children go to independent schools. So with all those caveats, though, one of the things that I thought was interesting um, was that uh, the difference in response from uh, those parents who had children at independent schools in terms of the, the satisfaction with the information that was provided to them in order for them to support their own children through their education. That was much, much higher than those who, went, who attended, uh, had children who attended state schools who felt that, even though these are obviously parents who, who are engaged and who want to be involved, it was a much lower rate that they of, uh, in, indicated that they felt that the level of, in, of information they were being provided in order to support their own children was, I say, was much lower uh, than it was for the independent sector. I wonder if you have any views on that. And given the fact that these are self-selecting groups and these are parents who are engaged and want to be involved, yet they still felt that they weren't getting the information required. Sarah? Um, 
You'll see in the um, evidence review that I'm bringing to the committee today that um, there's one study that looks at um, issues around culture. So most teachers are middle class and white and the parents who are engaged are also in the same cultural and socio-economic group on the whole and that presents a real challenge. And I think the fundamental model uh, at fee-paying schools is different, isn't it? Because the parents are customers. And I think in mainstream education, parents aren't really seen it's just a completely different basis for the transaction. Um, and I think if you look at uh, the evidence we've got, a lot of the good practices coming from outside Scotland and it looks very different from what, we, what the dominant culture is here. So um, I think there's still a sense that parents are maybe seen as a bit of a nuisance um, in, in lots of schools. And actually, there's a bit of kind of trying to hold people at arm's length. And we don't have a real culture of, oh, we must keep our parents on side, which, of course, the independent sector schools absolutely have to have. And is that, and is that entirely down to the, um, the cash? I just think you're, you're in a different model, aren't you? Because if you don't keep the parents happy, and the, they feel they're paying for this service, which includes that they know what's going on and they expect their children to achieve very highly. Um, and, and, it, and a lot of the evidence shows, doesn't it, that it's about those expectations. So as soon as you've got the parents expecting high achievement, then you, you suddenly open up a whole load of other opportunities. And that's actually true across... If you take out all of the other factors, so if you control for the other things that we know affects attainment, like um, class, levels of mother's education, the kind of things that we know affects attainment, if we control for all of those, having a parent or guardian or carer involved will raise attainment. So it's a fantastic um, lever that we know works across all of the different groups. I, mean, I, I, I absolutely accept what you're saying, but I, I'm, what I was interested in was the fact that even with those parents who attend, whose children attend skate school, who are very engaged, who are, who are middle class, who want to do the best for the children, who want to support their children, who, who respond to surveys like this, who are probably on the parent-teacher groups, who are involved in the school, clearly still felt that they were not getting sufficient information, a lot of them, to actually support their own children's education. Now, why, would, why would it be that those kind of parents feel that way, given their level of engagement? Eileen? can't speak for the, the, the independent sector. We don't really operate in there. But I, I would say that um, there are a number of factors at play. Um, one, the, the, the primary one is, is the, 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 the relationship or the lack of partnership between many schools and their parent group. Um, in, in our perspective, the education of our children should be a shared endeavour. You know, it is an area that, that we are both interested in as parents and as professionals. Um, but unfortunately, we're in a, in a culture now where many teachers simply want to parents to let them get on with their job. Um, and where some parents um, would say, let the teachers get on with their job. And I don't think that's good enough. You know, I think that the evidence says that actually we have to be in a shared space supporting our children and so as long as you have that kind of divide between let us get on with our job and let them do what they're supposed to do then we're never really going to get the results that we want from our young people okay. a lot to say around communication and the main fault it, it suggests is that schools tend to broadcast so they communicate, but they're not good at listening. So the evidence is really strong that communication between parents and schools is, about, is as much about schools listening to parents as giving out information. So I think a lot of it is about how schools then find out what parents want and what different groups of parents want and meet that need rather than just broadcast. And especially in sort of social media age, it's much easier, isn't it, to send information to everyone, but that may not be what people want. Okay. Sorry, Shona, did you indicate that? Yeah, I think I was just going to say in terms of the state sector, it, it's a much more complex picture for the state schools in terms of partnership for parents. It's not uh, the high-achieving parents wanting high achievement for their children as it is in the independent sector. You're having to think about how you engage the different 
groups of, of parents within uh, a, you know, a local primary school, for example, in Western Bartonshire, where you will have a really mixed group of parents, some of which are keen to be engaged, others who will have no confidence to be engaged. So you can't just be offering a one type of engagement policy or involvement policy. And the challenge, if we're really wanting to look at raising attainment, is about trying to engage our most vulnerable, uh, the families of our most vulnerable young people. And these are families who don't have the confidence, who are not sure what they could contribute in schools, who are not confident about coming to schools, and who need a lot of time spent in giving them a voice. And that is the challenge for our, uh, our local schools, is how do they create the time to give the very personal support, often having to go to the home first and foremost, not expecting that parents have the confidence even to come into school uh, to talk about their young people, but actually go and see where they're at in order to encourage them in. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Liam MacArthur. I'm delighted you said that, Shona, because as I was listening to the, um, the, the responses earlier, I, I, I had the sense that we were drifting into an area of, of, I suppose, surprise that there wasn't more engagement between uh, aspiring middle-class parents and, uh, and the schools for, for whatever reason. And actually, in terms of the attainment gap that we're seeking to address, um, we seem to have kind of gone off the, um, those who are perhaps most in need of that intervention. I mean, is it the panel's view that we need to get the culture right so it's happening across the board? And where inevitably it may engage with with those um, who are already or who, whose children are already um, achieving fairly well, um, before we can then spread that out across the piece, or should we be targeting the efforts to making sure that we address those who are most in need of that engagement um, right now, and that that may percolate out more widely? target those most in need personally if we actually want to make a difference in terms of the attainment gap uh, because I absolutely agree with the panel's view that uh, parental involvement uh, in children's learning is absolutely essential. Uh, but we know the gap uh, is already well established by the time children start school. So we have to be in there much earlier in terms of uh, giving parents the skills and the approaches to support their children's learning and that doesn't that isn't just a task for schools on their own. I do think there's a role for the schools to be a community hub to engage with parents, but they can't do it on their own. They don't have the capacity or the time because it is very time consuming and from a sort of individual um, teacher or just sort of people uh, point of view, so that you need to have multi-agency involvement in schools if you're going to really reach the most vulnerable and help them have confidence to support the children's learning. But up against the, the, the slight problem we get in a, in a range of areas where there's, there's a stigma attached to having that support in place because it's seen as other than what is the, the norm within that school environment. Yes, and I mean, we have done a survey of our own most vulnerable parents in Western Bartonshire, and that's exactly what we found. We uh, have a parent, uh, parenting strategy, which is to roll out parenting support, but actually parents objected to the idea of offering support because that did seem to be stigmatising. So we are now trying to badge things as opportunities for parents. Uh, it maybe seem a sort of, uh, you know, mute point, but I think the language in which we try and engage parents uh, is very important. And by providing the language right and giving opportunities and offering, certainly across the board, and not just targeted, but universal support, but clearly uh, as we are or, uh, offering um, opportunities, we are thinking about the needs of our most vulnerable and how you let them access these opportunities. Uh, and that is time-consuming and we need more than teachers working at that, in my opinion. I think we've got to be very cautious about focusing all of our attention on families and on parents um, because we're talking about a culture. We're talking about a culture within schools and the survey identified that even those parents who are engaged and are involved don't actually feel that the communication is as good as it could be. We're talking about a culture shift within our schools, I think. Um, and I would certainly say that there is a great deal of work to be done 
um, in teacher education, in ensuring that as, as our teachers are educated, they also understand the critical role that families play and how to work in partnership with families and why that's important. And also our school leaders, um, because I think I said in, in, in our submission, you know, in truth, in some schools, you get the sense that parents are a nuisance. Parents are part of the problem, and if only they would do what they're supposed to do, we would get on fine. So, you know, we can't continue to work in that way. We can't continue to work in our two camps. We have to have that shared space where we both see, where both parents and teachers recognise each other's roles and the value that we bring, and that, that it's not simply a case of fixing broken families. This is also about ensuring that the culture within the school shifts to a point where we recognise that shared endeavour. Thank you, Vera. I wanted to explore some of the issues around consistency. A number of the submissions that have been put forward uh, talk about uh, specific initiatives that aim to improve uh, parental engagement and educational attainment. And specifically, Western Hills Education Centre has provided very useful data that shows that amazingly they've managed to dramatically improve parental engagement to, so that 90% of parents are attending parent meetings in 2013-14 as opposed to 30% in 2012-13. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. But North, North Ayrshire Council says there's no evidence to demonstrate which approaches by schools have been most successful and, you know, and are being used throughout Scotland. And here we come to inconsistencies because a number of submissions have highlighted these inconsistencies across Scotland. Uh, and concerns have also been expressed as to how well education authorities actually collect data on what works or what doesn't work. Now, is there any evidence to demonstrate what the most effective means of involving parents is? Quite simply. Completely mixed bag um, of anecdote and, and evidence gathered, for the most part, out with Scotland, it has to be said, around what difference parental involvement makes and what models work best. Uh, you know, we highlighted in our submission that, that SPTC is currently um, starting a programme of taking forward the, the partnership schools model, which comes out of the United States. And the reason that we are doing that is because that is evidence-based. It's, it's based within the University of Johns Hopkins University, um, 30 years of practice and research there to back it up. Um, and so that's something that we are taking forward because we see that as being something that's not just a good idea that we've dreamt up in a, in a dark room of an evening. This is evidence-based um, and it is, has been shown to improve partnership with families and to improve attainment of young people. So, but I think the short answer is no, there isn't, um, and certainly not within the Scottish context. Extensively on this, so could we hear, you, hear what you've got your view on this? Yeah, well, um, you'll see from the evidence view, review that we were commissioned um, to do, and that we've that's available for schools to use as well on a website um, that the Scottish Government have made available. Um, that, that a lot of the evidence isn't in Scotland, although there are some little bits. And the problem with is particularly once you get down to measures, it tends to be initiatives that are measured rather than a broad strategy because it's much easier to measure individual initiatives than it is to measure a strategy. But I think, so there's lots of examples there of the sorts of things people can do. But I think if, you, if, you, if you're trying to try to think more about how you make it consistent across different schools and different communities, um, the, it's better to think what the evidence tells us as a whole. And that's much more around what do schools need to do broadly to improve um, parental engagement, and that's across all of their parents' groups. So, first of all, they've got to understand who those groups are and what those groups want, so, and that needs to be quite nuanced because it might look different for different kinds of parents and different kinds of needs. But then there's those six dimensions of family engagement that are in the um, review, and I think if 
all schools were doing all of those things, you would get some consistency even if they did them differently. So making sure that parents have enough opportunities to understand their child's educational and development needs, um, collaborating with the community and coordinating resources across community groups, providing opportunities for volunteering, making sure there's good information about learning at home. And, you know, the learning at home piece is really important, not just in primary school, but right through school. Um, and then the communication piece, which is partly about listening as well as getting information out there and involving parents in decision making. So if all schools were working on all of those dimensions in the way that they think would work best for their community, it might look a little different in different places because we're serving different communities um, and schools vary so hugely in size and scope. But um, I think that would be one way to start to build in some consistency and also let people try out some of the different initiatives that look promising and to build an evidence base that's relevant to Scotland around what works. Essentially, as you've highlighted, different approaches. Um, why is progress inconsistent? The approaches can be different, but surely we should be seeing some consistency in progress across Scotland. I don't think we're seeing that. Before going to go in, just, can I just check something? You, you've listed, you, you've you helpfully supplied it, but you listed the six areas of family engagement which you've just listed. Um, are these happening? I mean, is this going on now? Well, I, I don't know that much about what's going on, but I suppose there isn't a policy that says every school has to have a parental engagement strategy, for example. So what, are, what do schools feel they're obliged to do? I don't know. I think that's something you'd have to find out because I'm well, not sure. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Shona. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say, obviously, some schools are doing these things. I mean, I can think of schools in Western Bartonshire where almost all of these factors are, are, can be evidenced in how they engage with parents. Uh, whether it's having a, a big impact on attainment, I think our data is probably not good. But it's certainly not every school, but I think a lot of schools are attempting that. But I suppose I go back to what I said before, is it's enhancing the school's capacity to do that because doing all these things is time-consuming and, and getting enough uh, support from the community in order to do that is a challenge in, in these hard times economically when, uh, when we're facing uh, reductions in, in staffing that could support schools. But um, certainly these things are happening. Okay. Everybody else wants in, so I'm going to kind of start with Ian and then Jackie and then Eileen. Uh, just to follow on from some of the stuff, the progress, I would actually say parental involvement is going down rather than up across Scotland. Part of the issue is, is because of the workload that schools are now having. I mean, we're pushing forward attainment. My question back to you is, what is attainment? How are we measuring attainment? Nobody's, if you look at all the references we're looking at just now, attainment has only been measured with qualifications. We need to stop that. We need to stop saying how many hires the kids get. We need to start looking at wider achievement. Insight has got to start looking at tariff scores for the wider achievement. And I, I'll be honest, I think if we start scoring the tariff points properly and wider achievement, the attainment gap will close. That could be a quick hit for you. But I think the bigger question is, what is attainment? What are you measuring? But the actual the workload that schools are now doing. I mean, my, one of my schools is we have got a head teacher and two deputy teachers who are virtually in class for full time because they can't get supply. So the workload, how can they then do parental involvement if they're that busy doing other things in the school? And it's all through the, the, the budget restraints we're now under as well. And it's the prioritising. And the big thing just now is attainment. So they're taking their finger off the pulse to me on parental involvement because of that bogged down now in attainment. And we need to start looking at, as I say, what is attainment? I attended all the, the second head teacher events that happened across Scotland and presented at them. And some of the discussions with head teachers was quite interesting. And they're, they're just very concerned that everything has been pushed towards qualifications. And we need to, I would quite like to get into the discussion of what is it, attainment, and what do you think attainment is? Thanks, Ian. Uh, Jackie. I think um, <coughs> we have a huge untapped resource in Scotland, and that's the parents. And there's parents in communities that are absolutely 
ready to support each other and skilling up those parents to prepare other parents when their kids go to school and help support them in that transition. And they, they could be parents that are uh, in the community not working for various reasons. They are having breaks in their own employment, just had babies themselves. We have a huge range, but they are a huge untapped resource. And I think that's something that we could look at uh, rolling out to support other parents. Yeah. Eileen. Yeah, I just wanted to make two, two points, and one was, was really kick, picking up on what Mr Beatty said. Why is there not consistency? Well, one reason is because it's not measured, therefore it's not valued. You know, we don't, as part of the HMIE inspection, have any um, significant review of how a school is reaching out to its parent population. Um, so, as far as schools are concerned, it comes way down the list of priorities because actually they're measured on other things. So, you know, we have to be aware of that. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's interesting, this, this, this sheet and these six means of, of involving parents, that is absolutely what the Partnership Schools programme does. Um, that actually comes from the Partnership Schools model that we're rolling out because, again, research shows that if you engage with families and communities across those six areas, then you start to make a difference to how young people do at school. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary. Thank you. It's still on the same theme. Um, there's just something that, that you said that quite annoyed me, that uh, um, parents that uh, their children go to independent schools, uh, I think you said, well, they're customers. Well, in fact, parents who send their children to state schools also pay. We pay our taxes, we pay our council tax, uh, and just because we don't hand over a cheque every month for the school, we're still customers. And, uh, you know, I, I just get annoyed at that, that there's almost an assumption that the parents haven't got a voice because they're assumed not to be customers. We're actually paying absolutely through the nose. It's the biggest level of expenditure in, in education. And I, I just wanted to... I don't know if there's any comment, but that's my comment. But, um, okay, well, convener, let's the, move on to the questions then, Mary. Well... well <laughs> I, th I think that's worth saying, and if I have to say it uh, a few more times, I think it's still worth saying. It shouldn't be assumed that we haven't got any rights. Uh, it's back to the research convener, the point that you made. Uh, getting information about how a child is progressing, 85% uh, of independent schools strongly agree or agree that they get that information, 50% 50, 50 of local authority and you go on to, the school helps me understand and support my child's education. The independent schools, 86 agree and strongly agree, and then local authorities, 50. Now, the point is it doesn't cost any money to, you know, to help to understand the child's education or to give information. And I would go to Ian Ellis's point. I think uh, in your submission, you, say, a parent was, you said... A parent was told at the end of the year, oh, your child failed a maths test five times in a row. Uh, well, why not tell them when they failed it the first time so that they could help? And I thought the analogy about the parent getting more information about the MOT than about their child's education, I, I think that's absolutely horrific. On top of that, uh, Edinburgh Council looking at cutting 1,200 support staff. So... You know, and I look at councils, I can't think of any better example than what seems to be happening in Renfrewshire. So it's not that councils can't do it. We've got a paper here that starts with the early years. They're working with Glasgow and Strathclyde University. So, you know, my, my, my question is really that what we are asking to identify a child's attainment or lack of attainment it's not hugely costly, and if it's a culture problem, can it not just be overcome overnight? <laughs> yes. Sarah. Just, just briefly, you'll see one of the very promising initiatives in the evidence review is um, 
which is an internet-based one, is in some schools they start to publish these test results online and teach, and um, through the online classrooms, parents are allowed in some place, I think it's Australia, to log in and look at these. And so they, and, and that instantly increased parents then getting in touch with the school. But um, I presented this to a secondary school in Edinburgh, um, and it was interesting because the teacher's reaction to that was, oh, but they'd be getting in touch with us and they'd be using up our time. So I think the cultural piece, which is getting back to your to your previous uh, point, the cultural piece is not that um, that state school parents shouldn't feel like their customers, but that they don't, and that and that then they're not treated in the same way because of that of the less direct, obvious customer model. I think so. It's it's more. I think that the thing around attitudes and teachers seeing it as well, I was interested in that conversation because it's almost like, well, actually, that parent getting in touch with you might raise that child's attainment in your 10-minute conversation with them more than you can in the whole year. Actually, that's the reality, but that's not the view of the teacher. Thank you. Um, Shona? I suppose while I, I don't deny that there is a lot of work to be done and that we don't have consistency, I suppose I get a bit concerned in knocking the schools particularly when I know that many of the schools that I work with turn head off their heels to try and involve parents in realistic ways. But there isn't a simple answer. I, you know, in, uh, it's about how do you involve the parents. Uh, many of our schools find that parents don't come into workshops or to hear uh, at parents' night, etc. But they do come in to see their children perform. So they, come, so they have lots of initiatives where children are actually uh, performing or inviting their parents in to see work. And they manage to use that uh, activity to inform them a bit better about the curriculum and how they, they might engage with parents. We've got schools that spend a lot of their, uh, or teachers that give a lot of their free time and evenings to support some of the parenting groups like Incredible Years, like the, the FAST programme, which is a Families and Schools Together programme that is hugely life transforming for some of our, um, for some of our families in uh, challenging areas. But that is something that they do in the evenings and is hugely costly personally to them. Uh, so I suppose I just want to sort of plea that while, yes, there's more to be done, I think that the focus should be on looking at those schools that are doing a lot of good work and try and capitalise on that. Thank you, Eileen. I would simply say that, that, that you know, in a way, this segs in very nicely. Um, can we stop just dreaming up ideas and look at what's working? You know, it's the lack of focus on the evidence base that, that just drives me mad within Scottish education. You know, all, all these schools all over Scotland, all doing bits of good work, and we don't bring that together. We don't focus on what's working. Um, so focus on the evidence base and have a consistent approach. It doesn't mean that you're doing exactly the same thing, but it does mean that, you, that there is a common approach across schools. You know, and for many parents... I would say that it wouldn't take a great deal to improve the situation. For those parents who took part in your survey, who are already committed, who are already engaged, but don't feel it's good enough, it wouldn't take a lot to make a change. And therefore, we could actually focus a lot of energy on those parents where, where they struggle and, and schools struggle to engage them. Thank you. Mary? Final question. Um, I know that in Murray... Uh, parents who have children in early years in childcare, they can log in every day to see what letter or what word or what not. They can actually log in every day to see what their <coughs> child has done at the nursery that day so that they can focus on that letter. So, you know, if it could, I don't know how well spread that is, but uh, uh, I know that it's part of the care inspectorate's expectations at the end of the year uh, and Murray is a very mixed area between rich and poor. So my final question, I, I just throw that in but Jackie I know you've got an answer. Uh, the Audit Scotland report about that you've mentioned, there is no consistent means of monitoring or tracking achievement or attainment between P1 and S3 
and 27 out of 32 local authorities are buying expensive private sector tests, many of them from England, and there's no comparison at all. So could you just tell me what needs to be happened what needs to happen to bring forward a level of consistency, an identification of a child who's falling behind the class and to uh, support them to keep pace with the rest of the class? What do we need to do to ensure that that gap is identified and addressed? Okay, thank you. Jackie. Can I just go back to the yeah. there, um, Mary? I think that's another area where there could be a potential barrier, because if you're a parent and you don't have access to a computer and your child knows that other parents are logging in and they say, you know, you're not doing that, that could be a potential, but I think it is a great idea. But it, I, I think it all goes back to confidence. No, it's not a reason not to do it, but what I'm saying is it's a, it could be a potential barrier if you are a parent, especially if you live remotely and you don't have access to a, a computer. But the, it's going back to confidence for parents. Do you to pick up the child? If that was the case, they could just give them a note. Yeah, it, it's yeah. just fine. I, I think it's just opening up every avenue. Yeah. and Because there's not one child the same or not one parent, and we all learn differently. So it's finding all the different ways of doing it. But I think it's building the capacity within the community so that they then have the confidence to approach the school. Because it doesn't matter if you have all of these avenues. If the parents don't have the confidence, then they won't do it. So we need to find a way of building their confidence and their trust in the relationships between both. The early years is a good place Fabulous to start. place to start. Uh, Ian? A couple of things. Uh, I know I gave a, a quite horrific in my response, but we've got a rep who actually gets a text every day. It's an app or something they've got in their phone where the teacher actually sends, My, your child did this today, and they send pictures. The end of the week, they get a bigger... So there is excellent stuff going across the board. So I know we highlighted a, a few bad things that are happening across in the report, but there are really good stuff going on across the country. Your thing me about how do we, we measure? We did a, a work a working group. We held the working group last year, the sharing, learn, sharing assessment document that we produced, because a lot of parents didn't know where their kids were in broad general education. In the old system, the ATE, they knew exactly where they were. But now they don't. They don't know what strands are at. But part of the issue is I don't think what, there was a transition with teachers as well, not been too too sure. I personally don't know what the best thing is. Do we want to go back to testing in S3 and testing in P3 and whatever? I don't think that's what we want. But yes, Yeah, but I mean, I, I think that the, at the last committee I gave, I was I was about a I gave a bit of controversy, and I'm going to give you one here. I personally think we're teaching our kids too young. And we're talking about moving down to primary. They're kids. We need to realise these are kids. And are we actually teaching them too much too soon? If we start looking at the rest of the world, where they don't, they learn to play with each other. So I'm going to be a bit controversial and say, maybe we need to juggle the system again a wee bit. Because maybe it's not working the way it should work. And I personally think maybe we're teaching our kids too young, too early. School's too young, is that what you're saying? Yes. What age should start school? I'm not going to, I think it's a discussion we need to have, but possibly six, seven. But I think they need to be, I'm not saying there should actually be, there should be a system for them. It should be more nursery play-based. But to actually bring them in at four and a half, five, and start, and you look at what, the Scandinavian countries, what they're doing and what they're achieving. And you think, are we maybe pushing it? And it's just when you said, should we be starting earlier and early years, that alarm bell start ringing with me when I start hearing that. Because they are young kids. Great, I've got two members who want supplementary, so I want quick supplementaries from each of them before we move on. Uh, Liam and then Chick. Uh, thanks, Kevin. It was just following up, I think, something um, Eileen said before about um, HMIE or Education Scotland not um, uh, not testing uh, on this uh, during their uh, inspections. I mean, Education Scotland obviously has the, the responsibility for providing the support following on from, from any um, in investigation. Is this something where um, uh, there's an opportunity to say, look, one of the ways of addressing the issues that we've identified 
is through using these examples of um, of parental engagement. I mean, working through the the, uh, the the six strands there, which obviously are being deployed in, in, in many schools, but but not necessarily consistently across the board. Should we be inviting Education Scotland to to bake this into their um, the, the, their offering in terms of the support for sc for schools? Eileen, I'm going to start with Eileen this time. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, you know, if if we are saying that the influence of family is so important, and I think the evidence is there to say it's so important in, in, in um, supporting our children to do the best they can, then it has to be a part of what schools do to support families to support their children, to work with families to support children and work with communities. So I would say absolutely it has to be part of the process that HMIEs go through when they're doing a school inspection and post-inspection, it has to be part of the picture. As you say, bake it in. It's just part of the picture. I believe that this is what schools should be doing. It sh just should be part of it. It's not At the minute, it's, it's a kind of add-on, and we'll, we'll pick and choose. It's a pick and mix. We'll do that bit, and we'll do that bit, and we'll do that bit. Well, it shouldn't be like that. This should be an integral part of what every school does to assess their parent population, who are their families, what do we have to do to reach out to these families and to embed this school and what it's doing within its community? Okay. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. No. no. Okay. And Education yeah. Scotland or HIME are actually evaluating that just now and we're actually in discussions with them because we think it is a big internal part that they, they, really, they are missing in the inspections just now. So I'm hoping short term that things will start to change. Okay. Uh, check. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I was going to ask a question. I'll come back to it later about leadership and the quality of leadership uh, and community, and that does not necessarily apply. Uh, it has to come from schools. Um, but if I may, I'd like to come, to Dr. Morton, because we're talking about families. In some cases, you know, families have you know, single parents, and in your report, you, on page 27, you talked about engaging with fathers. Why is there a lack of, although it seems to have improved somewhat, why, do you, in your opinion, is there such a lack of engagement with, we're talking about leadership, uh, fathers uh, in the whole parental engagement? Because that appears to be a major element in terms of developing that um, you know, currency of, of aspiration. I think it's kind of um, not surprising at all because most of the people looking after children are mothers or women. So it's kind of inevitable if you go to any, any primary school playground, although times are changing, th at least three quarters will be the mothers. And actually it is women on the whole who are, who are caring and doing this uh, you know, work around school. So it's kind of not surprising, really, that we've ended up with many more women engaged than, than men, although there is a bit of a shift. And I suppose what I think is important around fathers, I mean, there isn't an obvious link between who it is that's engaged. It just matters that you have a parent or carer engaged. But for some people, that might only be a father. So then you might have to think very carefully about how you're engaging those fathers. And I suppose I think we should, we should think about fathers in the way that we do. We, look, we should be looking across the board for this particular school who you know who are the parents who we need to be engaging with and might we want to do something that's specifically aimed at fathers I would hate to see that become the driving I, but I think it's important to so, include. Sorry to interrupt you but again in your report you're saying the presence and engagement of fathers is positively associated with children's intellectual development social competence and emotional well-being. Yeah. But it's not um, there's not a comparator of mothers. There's nothing you can compare that. Is, this is true of a lot of the, of the research around different you know, mothers or fathers. There's quite often not a comparator. So if you look across the evidence as a whole, as long as you've got a parent engaged, it doesn't matter. But when they've looked at children who do have fathers engaged, then there's some positive effect. But it's very hard to measure that against parents who do have a mother engaged. There isn't an equivalent piece of research. So the research around gender is quite complicated to interpret. But um, we were asked specifically in this, route, in this review to look at fathers, and um, 
it is something that parents should be that if we're going to, if schools are going to be starting to strategize around this and think about how they're engaging parents of course they've got to have different kinds of parents in mind and that means thinking not just about mothers and but about fathers as well and i think particularly um it's easy for us to focus on early years and primary schools actually secondary schools i don't know if you saw actually since this evidence came in there was a report in the paper last week of a study in england showing that even children who are doing relatively well at 11 fall behind the, the least advantaged fall behind massively during the secondary school years so it's really important to keep secondary school in mind here as well Jackie did you have a quick comment is, is, is opening out the support that families have because it could be a, a grandparent as well an aunt or an uncle so it's looking at the family dynamic and who's the best person because it could be that the parents do have to work full time and they can't always make it and it's about the school's you know, I, I guess researching what that family is made up of and who's the best person to contact to support that child. So it's not just about parents. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Mark next. Yeah, thanks, Karina. I've heard um, workload being touched on briefly in previous evidence sessions as well. Uh, representatives of teachers have, have spoken about the really high workload and demands on their time just in their class. Is that actually um, possible for classroom teachers to make parental and engagement a priority and if so how do we then move teachers on to um, treat it as a priority rather than a hands off um, keep out the classroom and let me get on with my job I'd simply say if, if and I think we are, we are all agreed teachers and parents want the best for their children then actually this is not a competition because um, if teachers um, were more effectively engaged, engaging their parents, then it would actually make their job easier. You know, if we um, engage more effectively with families and kids were there more, so there was less absenteeism, the kids would do better. It would make teachers' jobs easier. If, you know, there's a whole load of things that, that parental involvement can influence, um, which will make a teacher's job easier and actually will in, improve the, the attainment levels of the young people and therefore you know, give that positive feedback to schools that, that they're achieving, achieving more for their young people. So you know, I think we can't look as, again, we can't look at this as something that's a bolt on. If we do this well, it, makes, it not only impacts on outcomes for young people, it makes schools a better place to be, a more welcoming place to be, and, and the kids who go there go more regularly, attend better to their classes, and do better. It's a win-win. Things have actually changed over the years. Uh, if, if you actually go back to pre Blaine days, and I hate to bring that up, but back then you, you could approach teachers when your kids were going into the school. And since uh, Dunblane, and I've heard schools still use it, it's very hard to get to teachers now. You've got to go through head teachers to get to a teacher. So, so that bit of personal uh, relationship has actually dwindled quite a bit after that. And it is very hard now. If you want to see a teacher, you've actually virtually got to get an appointment. So you used to be able to just a quick two-minute discussion before the day started or after the day started. So it's very hard to get to the teacher. Plus, as I said earlier, the workload is now vast. If they can't get supply staff, you can't just, there's no spare time to actually go in during the day to release a teacher. So it's very hard to actually engage now. We recently carried out a presentation to trainee teachers about how to engage parents. And the feedback that we got was that they found that was really useful. It's not something that they thought about before, but when we went and, and we spoke about that, they found it, you know, it was something that they could probably use and maybe in preparing parents and children for school, we could start to prepare teachers for engaging with parents. Yeah, I would think the enactment of the Children and Young People's Bill with GERFEC and where uh, you know, children and families are at the centre of all the planning has required us and local authorities to be uh, addressing the training of teachers and helping them to have methods of really putting children and families and parents at the centre of all the planning and I think that will I think that should have an impact on that dialogue that teachers and, and parents have together because they'll be planning together. 
Is it your view that effectively the, the, the rolling out of the uh, provisions within the Children and Young People Act, and in particular the focus on GERFIC, is or will have an impact in this area? Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sarah? I think part of it is also selling to teachers the, what parental engagement, engagement can achieve. So it's not just the better exam results um, and higher retention rates, and, but it's also pe uh, pupils behaving better, attending more regularly, um, adapting better, having better networks. So I suppose part of it is really winning them over to that idea, and the evidence is really clear that there's a lot of benefits. So, and, and, and so I, I suppose... We're talking again, aren't we, about a sort of culture change and trying to move people onto thinking differently about what the relationship is. OK, thank you. Okay. Um, we touched on training there, and uh, North Ayrshire Council in particular had suggested um, local authorities invest in training for teachers, particularly around parents' evenings, so that they're um, a valuable exchange so that teachers know exactly how the child... Um, develops and um, their behaviour at home and parents know exactly what they need to go away um, and work on. Do you, do you agree that that is a, a crucial part of parental engagement or if not, are there any other particular um, issues that you think schools need to be addressing around engagement? I'm afraid I don't agree that a five minute interview with a teacher is sufficient to achieve all of that. It simply isn't. You know, um, if, if you're going to have um, a change in, in thinking, a change in the way that parents support their children, in a change in the way that teachers and parents work together um, to support children, you're not going to achieve that in five minutes. I'm not saying that that shouldn't be done because it helps, but it's such a tiny part of what should be going on that we really have to get that into perspective. Can I also just make another point that... that a group of youngsters that we're forgetting in this discussion um, and who are actually the most in need of support are those who are looked after. Um, those are the children who um, are most vulnerable in our schools and whose, whose attainment and achievement levels are at their lowest, and yet they don't have the benefit of parents at home who are going to get involved or who potentially could get involved. So, you know, I think we have to, you know, capture somewhere the fact that we have to we have to have some mechanism we have to get have support for youngsters who are looked after and um, to ensure that that i heard someone saying you know every child needs somebody who's mad about them and that's absolutely true we all, all our kids need someone who's mad about them i'm mad about my kids and kids who are looked after tend to lack that adult who's mad about them we really have to make sure that somewhere we, we insert that within the system and we have an adult who's mad about a, a youngster and the youngster is equally mad about them and, and that adult takes on this role. Thank you. Ian? Hey, your uh, parents' evening, I call them speed dating because basically that's all you do. You race, especially in secondary school, you race round from one to the other. And miss most of them. Yes, uh, you find out somebody's already in your place. But the big thing about parents' night is teachers need to actually tell you negative. Instead of just trying to tell you positive things. If there's something not working, as in what I said earlier, the, f the failed five maths tests, tell us early. Don't wait until the end of term. I've been in that situation as a parents' night turning up in June to be told bad news about my daughter that happened six months ago. Teachers need to be able to say, look, you need to do stuff. This is what's happening. Instead of just trying to show you the good things that your child's doing in the class. And you were talking about training. We did a big thing with the Strathclyde University. We actually went to the fourth year students because I just happened to get into a conversation with them. And it was a day of different seminars they ran. And the parent seminar was actually the busiest seminar of the day because they were actually quite scared of what they were getting into with parents. And I think there's work to be done with teacher training where they actually they bring in real, te real parents to talk to them. So they actually go into school and they've not got this uh, thought in their head that parents are going to come in. Because as parents, we, we're just as scared as teachers. 
We, we just want the best. As Eileen said, we want the best for our children. And what we need to emphasise to, to teachers are, please tell us the negative as well as the good. And that would lead I mean, a huge difference to parental involvement. OK, and, and, and just to be personal for a moment, perhaps parents would be more involved if parents' nights didn't start at four in the afternoon and finish at six, which makes it quite difficult for a lot of parents to actually even yes. get there at all. But that's, maybe that's a personal bugbear, but anyway. Uh, uh, check, Brody. Yes, just, just if I may follow up on that, we were talking about something has to be done. I mean, there are four words that you know, come to mind. One is leadership. One is community. One's identity, and the last one that Ian just referred to, communications, which uh, I think has to be, as he indicated, not just all the positives, uh, and has to be, and of course, underpinning that is all the, the, the training. Do we have the leadership in the schools or among the parents to drive the agenda that we're looking at? In some cases, yes. I think there are some schools which are doing great work and which do have the leadership, but unfortunately, they're out there working on their own. And, and, and we, we, for all we talk about it a lot, we don't do a good job of sharing what's working. Well, it's, it's, um, it's the job of Education Scotland to capture the good stories and to share the good practice. That's, that's what Education Scotland is about. Um, they're working at it, but I think we're still not very good at it. Um, so so there, there is some good leadership, yes, absolutely, but there is also some pretty rotten leadership, I'm afraid. You know, and, and where, where you have parents who, are, um, who feel excluded and where the, the leadership of the school does not bring them in, um, and I keep going back to that, the survey that you did, even those parents who want to be and who are actively turning up at meetings and so on, don't feel as if really the communication is good enough. Well, I think we've got a long way to go. Billy, forgive me for interrupting. Surely, I mean, we talk about leadership and we talk about the, the dominance of the school in, in this, and, and yet we're still trying to encourage the parents. I mean, I don't know if Ian has a view on this. I mean, th there must be leaders among the parents. I, I can remember a, a colleague of mine having a conversation um, and it was actually with government officials um, and it was about a particular piece of legislation and, and she said, you know, if there was a lawyer on the parent council they would, they would run rings around this and the response was, there are lawyers on parent councils. Well, yes, because the parents who go to parent councils are all sorts of things but it's that sort of sense of um, not understanding that the parent body has capacity as well. They are at the minute, very much passive recipients of information. Um, they are not partners. Um, and, and so the information is sent out to parents and they're supposed to consume that and respond. Um, and what we need is a partnership where there is dialogue and exchange and where there, is, there are agreed outcomes, not simply parents being told what to do. And what about the identification aspect? I mean, in, in community, in building that community feeling. I mean, I'll come back to that in independent schools if I may later. Just yeah, I'll come back to that. I know that uh, Dr. Morton wanted to sure. respond to you first. Yeah, I was just, um, on the how do we share good practice question. So Education Scotland and Scottish Government commissioned this review, which is on a website called engagingwithfamilies.co.uk, and actually invites schools to, put, to add to it with their own examples of good practice. Last time I looked, that hadn't seemed to have happened much, so there may be some communication strategies around it. Um, but also, as part of it, there is a parental needs assessment sheet that is encouraging schools to think about um, how they assess parental needs, and also, um, the, and these were produced, produced by children in Scotland, um, and also um, uh, some guidance to kind of thinking about community assets. So there are some tools there for sharing and learning that schools don't know about. We've just heard about parents, some parents in disadvantaged families who don't have PCs or laptops. This or, is for and schools. They may, and there may be, well, it's for schools. But there may be leaders uh, amongst yes. that part of the community yeah. that we haven't tapped into. Mm. And, the, and the other thing on, on not having um, access to um, IT, of course, some schools are rolling out these uh, IT projects where every child gets a device and they, they have got quite a good evidence base around in, in increasing parental engagement, particularly in those families where that then becomes the, their only way of accessing the internet. So 
Um, that is one approach that is being used, certainly, in, in quite a few areas at the moment. Shona, did you want to...? Well, I suppose that in terms of leadership in uh, schools, I mean, while I agree absolutely with uh, Dr. Morton there about the uh, advent of IT systems and how that can improve sharing of practice, most of the head teachers that I know of read uh, their emails and go onto their computers at night as they're having their cup of tea before going to bed because that's the first time that they have opportunity to do that because the life of the school takes over. So I think we have to be rea realistic in our aspirations about what schools can achieve through uh, IT and uh, accessing and putting good practice up, etc. They would absolutely endorse that, but again, it's the, the reality of, of time. Ian? Just a quick one on your, your... The big issue is leadership, to be honest. And there's, there's stories, I can tell you different stories, but a school who had a, a tremendous parent council, really, really active. The head teacher left, they got a new head teacher in and the parent council virtually finished. But I've seen it the other way about, where a new head teacher's come in, the, the parent council's absolutely flourished. And the key thing is, the, the leadership has got to, there's got to be a relationship between the parent council and the, the head teacher. And it's, the head teacher, in theory, has got to want it. Because even, it doesn't matter how many parents want that relationship, if the leader of the school does not want it, you'll never crack it. He, the leadership does not, I repeat what I said before, the leadership does not necessarily have to come from, from the school. It can come from within the community. No, no. no. If, if, the, if the school, if the, the head does not want it, you'll never get it. You'll never get, get a, a partnership in the school. It's got to be, I wouldn't say led, but it's got to be a partnership. And if the, the head teacher does not want it, or puts obstacles in your way, it doesn't matter how many parents want it, you'll never crack it. Because you need the support. Quote Celsus, who actually are quote citing the UK Department for Education Research, who said, where there is effective parental involvement, the single most important factor was found to be the enthusiasm of the head teacher. I assume you agree with that. Yes. I think if you really engage with parents in the community, it's the relationship. The relationship has to start somewhere mm -hmm. and, and building on that. But it, ha it is a two-way process between the, the community and the schools. But it has to be a relationship and it has to be equal. And that, that's, that's the issue where the power dynamic is imbalanced. If you turn that on its head and you bring out the head teacher into that community group, and start to change the power dynamic if they're up for it, it that, that could be a way forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, George Adam. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to just a couple of questions, but initially go on Ian's point about leadership and uh, parent nights in particular, to good news and bad news, because from my own experience as a parent, my son had learning difficulties and I kept getting told how nice a boy he was. And I used to say, I know that, he takes after his father, you know. But uh, the whole point, I wasn't there to find that out. I wanted to know how he was doing academically. But it's also, we've heard in evidence when we visited the Western Hills Education Centre that there was leadership there from a head teacher that took that on. Uh, the really, things have improved. But they, very, they had to break things back down to basics. They had to teach teachers to teach instead of processing pupils. It was teaching pupils. Now, I found that quite interesting, and, you know, we're top of the real world, and we could see how the success was happening. I just wondered what your views were on that. Um, I think, you know, the point you make, that, that um, where teachers are struggling to really get their heads around, what can this young person achieve, and what can I say about this youngster, they will focus on the personality. Very nice youngster. You know, well, as you say, yeah, well, I know that. Um, so I think that's not an uncommon um, experience. Um, but that comes back to this thing about how are we talking about achievement, attainment? I mean, I would, I know this is something that Ian talked about earlier, and I would agree that parents, you know, have actually pretty straightforward requirements from a school. They want their child to be happy. They want them to be looked after. They want them to do the best they can. Now, if that means 
um, that they achieve six hires and two advanced hires, that's the best they can. But if it means actually they turn up at school every day, they're willing to learn, they participate in the school community, um, and they get a few, I was going to say standard grades, but if they get a few N4s and N5s, if that's the best they can do, then parents will be happy with that. But it is that thing about the best they can be. Um, and, but because schools see academic attainment as, as the, the standard by which they're measured, if a youngster isn't going to achieve those five hires and two advanced hires, they struggle to say, actually, this youngster's doing really well, he's doing the best he can, and he's going to do brilliantly at this and this and this. It's about changing the nature of the dialogue, isn't it? That attainment isn't everything. It's about the wider achievement and the wider participation in the school community. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that is very evident in a lot of the schools now that you are celebrating the wider achievement and there's all sorts of outdoor activities, forest schools, nurture groups, you know, to, to meet the needs of the wide variety of children that we have. And But the challenge for schools is getting parents to understand the the benefits of all the different activities because some parents are still very focused on the exam results. Uh, so that's a, just another barrier to that communication that we've talked about. But I certainly agree with everyone's comments about building that relationship being crucial. Okay. Ian, you want to come in? I agree with what Sean is saying. That's what I was going to say. There's, we talk about education to our children, but we actually there's a lot of work here we actually need to do towards our parents. And not just our parents. I hate to say it, we need to educate you guys, ministers, we need to educate local councillors to try to change the mindset. It's not all about qualifications, the wider achievement. As, as again, when I spoke at the leadership events across the country, what I said was, it's great the kids achieving, but we need to look at what they're achieving. Are they achieving the best, as Eileen said, the best that they can achieve? And a child actually getting, an, I hate to say it, an N1, 2 or 3 or 4, that's an achievement for that child. It's the same as an achievement, as Eileen said, a, a child getting advanced hires and hires. That's their achievement. But we need to look at the wider picture. But we need to educate parents. Because when I was at school, it was everything was about qualifications. So my child who's just went through, one of my children who's just went through school, that's obviously what I was concerned. What a qualification was she coming away with? And somebody said to me, when, when will this actually change? And unless we actually educate the parents and everybody else in the country, employers, everybody, then the only time it will change is when my daughter has her child at school going through this, because that's her experience. So I think there's an awful lot of work to be done to actually educate others apart from our children in the school. Okay, Sarah. Just a point about, um, it's also about expectation. So the really powerful thing a, a teacher can do is raise a parent's expectations of their child. So the teachers are already going to have a sense of, oh, we expect you to do this or that. But when teachers have low expectations, particularly for those who are least likely to attain well, then they're going to just reinforce a parent's attitude. Whereas if the teacher says, oh, we expect him or her to do this, then you can actually start to pull in parents' expectations. That can, then that's the really powerful combination. Okay. Sorry, George. Is this, is this a very specific so that, if I may, um, One of the things we've discussed before, and I think Ian referred to it in, 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 it was referred in the MPFS paper, how much distortion does the focus on academic qualification uh, play in terms of parental involvement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vocational qualifications? Sorry, could you clarify we, your question? Well, in terms of, you know, we, we've heard for, for years that you have to go to university, 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 uh, and that creates a culture of this is what, is, is what we mean by attainment, when in fact, in previous sessions we've talked about, we, you know, we need people to do who are not necessarily a, a potential university students, but are very, very capable and can attain a, much, you know, a greater contribu contribution through the vocational route. So how much does that distort the whole attainment uh, spectrum? 
I think it, it hugely. Uh, that, and that's what I just said in my, in my last statement was we need to educate people. I mean, there, there's tremendous things that, that children out there are, are doing and achieving, but they're not getting a qualification. But if you look at different how, what different authorities are doing, I've, there's stories that, that I could tell you that there's children out there who are getting into college without the qualifications they should be ha they, they should actually need to get into that course because the, the, the authorities actually worked with the college and these children have moved on. So there, there's more than one way to get into college and into university. And it's just been, it's all about education. And we, need, we do need to actually look at the wider achievement. And that's when insight comes into it. Uh, but we need to score it properly. Uh, Okay, yeah, I get, I get the point, Eileen. I was just going to say that there's, there's a, a generation of parents, and I'm one of them, who's seen their youngsters going through school, aiming for hires, going to university, getting their degrees, and then nothing, mm -hmm. or nothing of value. And we have been sold a story about the golden ticket that is the degree, and it is not a golden ticket. So, you know, there, there, there is a dialogue to be had around creating realistic expectations for young people and actually providing them with the support to do the best they can to move in the direction, the career direction they want to do. And whether that's academic or vocational doesn't matter. I would make the point that the, the most prized academic, uh, you know, the degrees are absolutely vocational because you become a doctor or you become a lawyer. Well, if, there's not, if that's not vocational, what is? So I think we have to change um, the narrative about vocational and academic. Okay, uh, thank you. Sorry, George, interrupted yes. you. Can I go uh, ask about parents with greater needs? You know, we, we talked about it in some uh, detail, but how do we uh, get to them? It's been interesting, some of the things that uh, it's been said so far, because it's not all about the school. It's about the third sector, it's about other organisations. I was interested in what Shona said about the fact that some schools are accessing parents through uh, plays or drama or culture or sport or various things like that. Uh, and also uh, Jackie Tolan said about the fact that you know, some parents are coming from difficult educational backgrounds themselves. Now, some of the evidence we've already had, the SPTC said that in many cases the third sector and external funded projects play a significant role in taking forward this work rather than the school itself. And I'd like to explore that more because would it not be easier for these parents to access that type of thing as opposed to the school themselves if they do have uh, their own emotional baggage that they've had from the time at school? Shona. Well, we've got a very interesting project just now uh, linked with Action for Children where they have been engaged with and training parents to be buddies of other parents so that they have, uh, you know, schools have asked Action for Children to link up some of the more um, needy parents or parents that have the most stresses in their life with volunteer parents who can help them do just the sort of ordinary things that they perhaps lack the confidence for doing, you know, playing with their children, taking them to appointments, coming into school, uh, engaging in some of the parenting opportunities. And that has been a huge success. I, I mean, a very small project, I have to say, but a huge success in terms of both the parents who volunteered, because many of them have gone on and got extra qualifications as a result of that volunteering. And also it's allowed school to find a way to uh, bring in parents that are perhaps furthest from mainstream services. Jackie. Um, <clears throat> just on the, the labelling that we actually use about uh, needy parents and vulnerable parents, yeah. we can all be needy and of vulnerable course. you know, in, at any point in our lives. But the, the, the parents that we engage with, it is that whole... Um, our whole ethos is parents for parents. So there's, a, there, there's a, a, a bit of equality there when they come along to a, an organisation or a group. They know that it's other parents who are further down that journey, further down that road. They've had some training, but they know that it is a journey. And ultimately, at the end of it, they want the confidence to be the best parent that they can be for their child. And that's what draws people to organisations that support them, because they know that they need that, and they know that they've got that vulnerability. And... Um, I was talking to someone the other day that were talking about areas of multiple deprivation. And if people are growing up, kids are growing up hearing that about the place that they live in, 
I was brought up in Drumchapel. I didn't know that I was living in an area of multiple deprivation. I had a great childhood. So if people are hearing that story and those labels, then they grow up with that mindset. And I think that's something that we, we really could change. Thank you. George, you OK? I, I agree uh, with Jackie because uh, the labels we do use are important because, uh, uh, you know, my... Uh, a child from Fergusley Park in my constituency doesn't grow up thinking that they're in an area of deprivation. And I think it's important that we do actually uh, to be very careful in how we deal with these. It's, you know, the, the areas, the areas themselves have got challenges. The people just happen to be there. So it's like structural stuff that has to change. You need to get it right. Yeah. No. Nope. OK, yeah. thank you. I just, I, I'm really pressed for time, Eileen um, Chick. Just briefly, uh, on, on the um, independent schools, the, the, the so-called contract, I mean, is there any point or possibility or benefit from replicating that in state schools? Well, I think there is something to be said about how do we raise parents' expectations around engagement. Because we've been focusing quite a lot on schools and what they can do. Um, and so the community group is one. But there might be something more on the sort of, um, you know, population-wide in terms of, well, actually, you, you know, you should be involved. It, it sh the norm should be that you're involved. Because the thing that, that you come up against again and again is, well, actually, we provide these opportunities. The people who are interested come. You know, and so that's, that's good enough. So it's almost like trying to raise parents' expectations about what involvement might look like from their point of view and the sorts of things that, you know, that help in the, in the home environment around, around learning and learning support and maybe trying to change minds um, you know, in the population in general as well. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. And I was certainly hoping with the increase in the early years hours that there would be built into that some sort of expectation. Uh, I know a lot of it is about enabling parents to get off to work, but for the, many of our, our, our parents, they're not in working, but I would like to see the expectation of them becoming involved with their child in nursery. Yes, engage and yes, have the extra hours, but come in and join the nursery staff in engaging with their children and, and start that learning journey uh, in order that we can address that attainment gap that we know starts in the early years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, okay, thank you. Siobhan. Thank you. Um, I'm quite interested in the legislative changes that have happened um, from 2006 to the Parental Involvement Act and a number of submissions spoke about the mixed review of that act, if, if we're being polite about it. Um, Renfrewshire Council said there's no evidence that parental involvement alone raises attainment and, and therefore um, speaks to the act. The Poverty Alliance reported mixed views but highlighted one comment that the Parental Involvement Act has actually widened widen the inequalities as more confident parents took control why others were pushed aside. And in the SPTC's um, evidence, it said, in our experience, the level of support being provided at local authority level to parents and parent groups through parent officers and similar has declined significantly over the years since the parental involvement legislation was enacted. Just really to get your views on that first before um, we have a discussion further. I mean, I, I would simply that, that, that certainly... You know, in Audit Scotland um, produced figures on this, the, the, the number of parental involvement officers and the amount of time that they have to support parents and parent groups has diminished significantly over the years. Um, there is no evidence about the impact of the legislation, and I would say that's a big want at the minute. I think we actually do need to have some research done to see what change has that made. Um, and we work with parent councils and, and parent groups up and down the country. We've got people out most nights of the week during term time working with parent councils. And, and the, the thing that we say to them is, A, how do you represent all of your parents? And B, how do you communicate and involve, communicate with and involve all your parents? It doesn't mean having them round the table, because that's not practical. Um, but how do you do that as a parents group? And I would say those are the two big challenges that parent councils have. Um, and, and as an organisation, we're really the only folk at the minute, other than the one or two parent officers who are out there, we're the only folk who are helping them to do that. But, but why is that declining in your evidence that you gave? You said that it had gone backwards since the act 
came into force rather than the opposite way that you would have probably thought in 2006 would happen? The level of, 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 of involvement from, from parent officers? Yeah. Well, it's quite simply because local authority budgets have been squeezed, people have been removed from post or given um, lots of additional duties. So they may hold the, the title parental involvement officer, but they also deal with um, homeschooling, they deal with complaints, they deal with consultations, they deal with 101 other things. And so the amount of time that they have to support parents and parent groups has shrunk right back to, to the point where it's almost negligible in some cases. Okay. And how representative do we think parent councils are on that? I mean, Ian, you spoke about in order for the ethos in the school to work, the head teacher has to be directly involved, regardless of the will of, of parents. Do you, do you find, anecdotally or otherwise, that, that parents see if the parents council, so the dozen that sit on that, that, that they'll do the work and the rest of us can sit back and, and watch for that to happen? Or do you know, how, how do they get involved with that? Again, it varies so much across the country. It's, and it's, it's down to, again, it's down to relationships with how much your, your parent council, A, want to do. You have different parent councils. Some parent councils, all they want to do is just go along and listen to what the head teacher's got to say. You have other parent councils who actually want to go and actually look at the uh, improvement plan or the development plan, whatever you want to call it, for the school, and actually how can we take this forward? How can we then get other parents involved? So it varies so much across the country, but I totally agree with what Eileen's saying about the parental involvement officers and authorities. There are very few and far between now. And I'm, I think some of the submissions is it, it says, look, 40% of their time. Well, I reckon some of them you'd be lucky if it's 10% of their time is actually spent in parental involvement now. And there's one authority, Dundee, have actually have got a dedicated parental involvement officer. And she is very active out there. And there's some really good things going on in Dundee. And but you, you talk to directors and you say, why can't we replicate this across the country? And as Eileen said, it's all about budget. It's all about money. They cannot afford to, to put that as they see. But if they want to take it seriously, and if if some of the reports are true that parental involvement can, and I personally think it can, help raise attainment, then if they're serious about it, then they need to do something more locally as an authority-wide on parental involvement. We had a discussion earlier about those parents who probably are more active in, in certain areas, you know, the middle classes and various other things. Do you think, and again, this is just... Maybe it's a view born out of no evidence, but those in parent councils are those who um, have the confidence, it goes back to the confidence, who are in positions in their working life and think, OK, I can articulate that message, I'll get involved. Whereas those parents who didn't have a good schooling, didn't have that experience, sit back and don't think that they can become involved in that. I mean, is that, is that fair to be saying that? I would say yes and no, to be honest with you. Uh, there's, there's some schools in very highly deprived areas the, the work the parent councils are doing is absolutely spectacular. Yeah. And it's actually, it puts a lot of schools that, with well-to-do parents to shame the work that they're doing. So, yes and no. Sorry, just on that point, no, sorry. I mean, if, if the school's in a deprived area, so the school that I went to would probably be in that, but the parent council would be made up of parents who weren't necessarily themselves from a deprived background, so so I find that you know, like it, it might be working in a deprived school, but are the parents. Yes, I'm talking. About, I'm talking. I'm talking about schools. I'm talking about parents who have right, actually okay. come from. And it comes down to leadership. Sorry, Jackie, sorry, sorry Island Jackie. Was the, just... the, the parents that are involved in the parent teacher councils will already be engaged and the parents and the community. It's building that bridge between the bo both of them and preparing them for that transition into a parent council. And I think that's where we, we, we could focus on. So if you can build the confidence, because they don't, if they're not engaged in the school, then they don't know how to make that step to the parent teacher council. So it's, it's, it all comes back to the confidence, changing their mindset and, and opening the door. And again, changing the power dynamic, because it's always having to go into the school. There has to be a wee bit coming the other way to show that it is a two way process. I could, could try that. And just finally, do you think legislation is needed to, to close the attainment gap? My, my view the, the, the bill has come 
through you know, come into to the committee recently is that, that it's very interesting to see attainment gap in there um, and as ever the devil will be in the detail but my my perspective is that actually um, what I would like to see is that the guidance that sits behind the bill actually puts uh, the onus on local authorities to use evidence-based practice that is commonly shared to achieve this um, what we've talked about this morning to, to achieve some sort of consistency of approach um, across local authorities because we don't need more initiatives you know we, we absolutely within Scottish education I think we're initiative out so let's let's actually use what's happening what's good what we know works and apply it consistently rather than 32 local authorities all going off in different directions and doing different things again Thank you. Um, Lee Thank you. I, I thought Dr Morton's body language there uh, in response to the question, do we need legislation to achieve this, was uh, <laughs> very eloquent. Um, I, I mean, I've been struck that over the course of the last hour and a half, we've been slightly schizophrenic in, in our discussion of raising attainment and then closing the attainment gap, which clearly are two separate things and I'm struck that that schizophrenia is not limited to this uh, committee the, the the Education Scotland bill that we'll be considering uh, shortly talks in the policy memorandum of of the government's commitment to help make Scotland a fairer more equal place uh, through improvement of education attainment for all um, and then the start of the bill the preamble to the bill um, talks about the Scottish Parliament imposing duties in relation to reducing people's inequalities of outcome now are we in danger of getting drawn into um, aspiring to have everybody above average um, or some kind of trickle-down attainment economics where if we, if we focus on raising attainment for everyone, then it, it will benefit those um, who are perhaps most in, in need? I notice, Ian, that in keeping with uh, your attempt to be controversial um, that the, uh, in the evidence suggested that uh, uh, you agree with Audit Scotland's view that spending should be targeted on the parents, pupils and schools that need it uh, the most. The focus should not be on re raising attainment for all, as this will continue to raise the bar while not addressing the equity gap. I'd be interested to know whether or not we are in danger of spreading ourselves across two almost mutually contradictory uh, uh, objectives here. More of a reflection than um, what's necessarily explicitly in the evidence, but it would seem that there's some really good practice going on in schools that are targeted in areas where they know they've got a high level of need and they have to get out of the door and they have to work really hard to involve parents. Um, I suspect maybe some of the risk is more in the big mixed schools where it's actually easy to get some parents in the door, but there'll always be a cohort who are never appearing. And actually for those schools, they can say, oh, look, we've got 75% of the parents are coming to parents evening but actually the 25 percent are not are the ones who would probably benefit most from um from some in, some interaction so they're not they're not completely mutually exclusive um and i suppose um what ian was saying about you see some middle class parent councils that are doing really badly actually they're probably also in those really mixed schools because it's easy for them to be on the parent council and they don't really feel that they have a duty to try and involve everybody so um so I think maybe a nuanced approach around trying to think about, it. we know that parental engagement will benefit every single child. So we should be thinking about it um, across the piece, but then there will be some targeting that will suit different kinds of schools in different ways. Priority, and we've heard, I think, Shona, you talked earlier on about um, the, 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 the kind of the time and I suppose the financial resource that could be involved, and um, particularly in, in, in helping those, whether it's looked after children that Eileen mentioned or others who need, may need that additional support. If we don't prioritise or we prioritise everything, then nothing is a priority. Um, and therefore, should we be more ruthless in saying, yes, this will benefit the school environment as a whole, but actually, trying to address that gap rather than simply attainment as a whole is, is the priority we should be focusing on. 
Well, I think if we want to close the attainment gap, we absolutely have to target resources with, the, with our lowest performing 20%. But I would think that anything that we do with that lowest performing, if it is in terms of relationship building with families or in terms of the methodology and pedagogy in schools in terms of teacher skill, is going to benefit all. Uh, but I, I think we do need to think very clearly about what the evidence says, the evidence-based programmes, and as I say, there are a number around, but they are costly, and, uh, and we need to target resources there if we want to close the gap. Well, I mean, I think you have to look at the PISA study. You know, the difference, the biggest difference is within schools, not between schools in Scotland. You know, the, the gaps, so you, you can't look at individual schools and say we'll target that one and we'll not target that one because there are massive differences within individual schools um, and the parent population and the families involved with those schools. So my sense is that actually we do have to start with a universal approach but um, be prepared to, to put in additional funding for specific projects or programmes where there is a, a clearly identified need. Sorry, I mean, to, to make clear, I mean, I, I certainly recognise the, the, the gap within schools as much as between schools. But actually, again, still there, um, if you're not prioritising, and, and we see this with the, with the survey, in a sense, a self-selecting group will say, look, at the engagement with parents isn't great amongst us, and look at us, we want that engagement. The danger is you get sidetracked into trying to deal with that rather than deal with the, 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 the more fundamental problem which I think you yourself identified at the beginning Eileen is that you haven't actually heard from the ones who you most need to hear from and where most support is probably needed. Is that, mm. that fair? Yeah. Can I, can I just follow up? I mean, obviously the, the recent announcement by the Scottish Government of the £100 million attainment fund I think is targeted at seven, seven local authorities I think it is from, from memory. Um, clearly that, is that the kind of thing you're talking about that that should be done? Or is there something more of that? It will find its way into programmes yeah. specifically focusing on parental engagement with schools. Yes, but I mean, my mm. point is that I mean, it's not a universal, it's not a fund that's going across every local authority, every school. It's, it's, it's specific to those areas where um, there is the kind of uh, the, the least advantage, if you like, you want to put it that way. Sorry, Ian. Just a couple of things on that is what's the money going to get used for is, would be my question. I mean, yes, it's great at any bit of money that we put out there to help education. Yes, superb. But are we just, at this moment, is that 100 million, the 20 million that's just been shared amongst the seven authorities? Does the, does the government know what's that actually going to be used for? Should we not have maybe done a wee bit of work to see what we're actually going to use that money for first and foremost? Because we can all probably share examples of good practice that are pilot projects that's been on across the country that we have made a huge difference, but it's not sustainable across the country. But we, it just, if you put in the resources, we can do it. But my question probably to Liam is, I'm asking you a question back, what gap are we closing? What are we measuring to close that gap? You have to, we, we, again, back to what I said earlier, what are we going to measure? on attainment. What is attainment? What gap? If we start, we need to look at what are we actually trying, what gap are we trying to close? Is it the gap for qualifications? What gap is it? I don't know, and I'm a parent, and I'm chair of a national body, and we don't know what gap we're actually trying to close. We just hear we want to close the attainment gap. What, attain, what are we talking about attainment? And I think we actually need to clarify what we're actually calling attainment, and then how are we going to close the gap? I mean, in, in response to that, I think there's a general acceptance that a wider perspective on achievement is, is, is certainly desirable. But I think also it's recognised that um, that gap is being borne out in, in life outcomes in terms of positive destinations post-school, whether that's through further training at college, whether it's job experience or, or, or whatever it may be. I think that's, I think that's the gap that, that is being addressed, rather than whether or not you want everybody to be aspiring towards five fires, which I don't think anybody really is. Come back to you in that and... Positive achievement. Just, it will be very quiet. I mean, how we how, how we record things then? I mean, I can tell you, a child attending college for half a day a week is called positive achieve positive destination. I don't think a half day a week at college for a child is a positive destination. 
Mm -hmm. So we need to look at what we're actually recording. I, I, I don't, don't dispute that. I, in following up the convener's question in relation to the attainment uh, fund, I mean, clearly this has been targeted in seven uh, different areas, but there are going to be pockets of poverty. There's going to be attainment gaps in the other 25 local authority areas. Are we in, in danger then of, of, of taking an approach that, that says um, this, by our measure of multiple deprivation, looks like a sensible policy, but actually in terms of, of treating each child as an individual, um, we're not going to make, make the headway that we, we, we need to make um, in terms of, I think, University of Scotland identified 70% of those um, uh, living in, in the poorest uh, households actually don't fall within that SMID 20 measure. So we've, we've actually spent quite a bit of money um, not really targeting this uh, in an appropriate fashion. Is that fair? Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, can I, can I uh, pass on the thanks of the committee for your attendance today? It's been um, just over an hour and a half, so I think we've, we've given that a reasonable uh, crack at that um, uh, subject. So I I'm very much appreciate you coming along and giving your time today. Um, uh, we are obviously in the middle of an uh, inquiry into this attainment, you know, whatever the attainment gap might be, Ian. I think that uh, we are um, endeavouring to look at it and hopefully try and come up with some suggestions to uh, resolve it. Um, as the committee has agreed to hold the next items in private, I now close the meeting to the public. But before I do so, just for the sake of clarity, um, I should point out that Mark Griffin uh, will not take part in the discussion at item five, where we will consider the approach to our stage one report on the BSL bill, uh, because he obviously is the member in charge of the bill, but he will be here for the other items on the agenda that are being taken in private. So thank you very much, and I close the meeting. <laughs>